Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Zaman. I'm a second year physics student and also an opinion editor for the Oxford Blue. Hey, everyone. Um, my name is Carlotta. I'm a second year PPEist and the senior investigations editor for the Oxford Blue. Um, for those of you who haven't attended one of our Blue events yet, um, I'll give a quick run through of um, how these work. Um, so we've been running these events since last Hillary, um, and due to the joys of the pandemic, have now had to move them online. Um, but we're still trying to bring you interviews and workshops from leading figures in journalism, the media industry, and society at large. Um, in the past, we've hosted journalists like Alan Rusbridger, Eski Bazaran, and John Simpson, to name just a few. And we have a number of exciting figures to come this term, including the head of the BBC World Service and the Pulitzer Prize winning and the Pulitzer Prize winning senior opinions editor at the Washington Post um, for their coverage of the state-sponsored assassination of Jamal Khashoggi. We take a lot of pride in our committed efforts to develop journalistic skills in our team of talented and wonderfully promising um, writers and editorial staff um, who are largely new to journalism. The paper was founded on an ethos of access to a professional sphere that often feels impenetrable um, and dominated by certain demographics. This is where these master classes come in, and we hope that they provide um, inspiration to aspiring writers and prove to be a great way of learning from journalists um, whose work we read and admire. So if you want to get involved with journalism um, after this, <laughs> after watching this, um, then join one of our Facebook groups for weekly commissions and updates. Um, I'm really, really happy to welcome Nicole Hong here today, um, and we'll now hand over to Zaman to give a brief introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so, as Carlotta said, we're excited to welcome Nicole Hong uh, to this event today. Uh, Nicole studied journalism and political science at Northwestern University. Uh, she then joined the, joined the Wall Street Journal in 2012 as an intern and subsequently became a markets reporter between 2013 and 2014, and later a legal reporter from 2015 to 2019. In 2016, her page one expose on cargo shorts sparked a national debate and resulted in a newsroom rally by her male colleagues paying tribute to their cargo shorts. I kind of imagine how horrible that must have been. Um, then at the Wall Street Journal, she was part of a team that won the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in national reporting for stories about secret payoffs made on Donald Trump's behalf to two women. In October 2019, she joined the New York Times and she has recently uh, reported on uh, many legal cases in New York, including the trial of El Chapo, uh, who was a drug cartel leader, uh, trials relating to affirmative action, and more recently, uh, the trials of the leaders of the Nexium sex cult, um, a trial of Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, who is Jeffrey Epstein's ex-girlfriend and was charged with facilitating the sexual abuse of minors. And just six days ago, uh, for, the end, for the New York Times, broke the story of the arrest of Ken Curser, former editor of the New York Observer and close friend of Jared Kushner on cyberstalking charges related to his divorce. So Carlotta, I think, will start off some of the questions we have. Yeah, lovely. Okay. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to remind everyone that um, with any questions that they have, you can just put it in the chat um, and later we can get to them. And also, um, I just wanted to invite Nicole to say a few words if she wanted to, um, just in general about her career before we move into questions. Sure, I'll just say something quick up front. I mean, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this. I have a really soft spot for college papers because I worked for my high school newspaper and also my college newspaper at Northwestern. And it was really the reason I became a professional journalist. Um, I never envisioned this becoming my career because it just seemed very intimidating and daunting, but it was really my experience at my college paper that, um, you know, taught me how to report a story, how to deal with reader criticism, how to hold powerful people to account. So, you know, I applaud all of you for being part of this um, because student journalism is so, so, so important, um, especially right now. And uh, yeah, thank you, Zaman, for that introduction. Um, you pretty much covered all the bases for my career. Basically, um, 
after I graduated college, I started as an intern at the Wall Street Journal. Um, I did a lot of internships in college also. And yeah, I mean, my big thing was switching to the law enforcement and legal issues beat around 2015. Um, Cause that was an area that I've always been interested in. I actually thought I would become a lawyer myself um, and go to law school. But then once I started writing about lawyers every day, I realized that I did not want their life. <laughs> um, so yeah. And then, you know, one thing led to another and then the Michael Cohen investigation took up like a year of my life. And that was kind of what led to me joining the New York Times. So yeah, excited to be here and uh, look forward to hearing your questions. Great. Um, thank you for that, Nicole, and, and thank you for joining us today. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you. Um, and now you've kind of um, started off the answer to my first question, um, which would have been, um, what made you go into journalism? Now, I don't know if there was kind of a, a one reason that made you join school papers in the first place, or if that kind of um, just happened and then you so happened to become a journalist. Um, what's the story there? Yeah, so it kind of started with just my upbringing. Um, I was born and raised in the US, but my dad is a professor. So we always moved a lot. We moved from kind of college town to college town. And I moved in the middle of high school from Pennsylvania to Indiana, which if you know anything about the US, it's a very big culture shock to go from that state to Indiana. Um, so I show up at this new high school, I don't know anybody, I have no friends, and then I see a flyer to join the school paper. And I was like, oh, this will be a good excuse to meet people because I can just interview them and meet them that way. But once I got started, I just really fell in love with it because you know, it was kind of the only avenue I felt like we could sort of question authority and really cast skepticism on school policies that we felt were inappropriate or improper. I mean, it was really my first taste of kind of accountability journalism. And it was also the first time I had really seen the power of journalism as a way to shine a light on victims and, you know, vulnerable people. Like I wrote a story in high school just about a state of suicides that happened and just the reaction to that story just showed me how powerful journalism can be in terms of starting a conversation. So yeah, that was really how it started for me. And then I kind of, yeah, applied to journalism school at Northwestern on a whim. And then, yeah, here we are like 10 years later. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, I think for lots of us students at Oxford. I don't think there's really a journalism degree at Oxford, certainly not one that I know about. Um, and so when it comes to journalism and especially investigative journalism and so on, a lot of what we're doing is basically making it up as we go along. Um, so I was wondering if you could uh, tell us a bit about uh, sort of the process um, at sort of established institutions. So, um, things like what do you do to follow up leads? You know, is there a set procedure that you go through? Yeah, I think it depends obviously on what you're investigating, but you know, sourcing is very important. So I would say if you're interested in investigative journalism on your campus, the first thing I would do is to kind of develop relationships with the people who are making the key decisions. So that's the administrators, it's professors, it's student leaders, because I think, you know, when you get a good tip, the key is you want to corroborate it. And the best way to corroborate things is through either documentary evidence, like having someone give you emails or text messages or photographs, or to have them um, or to have so many witnesses describe the same thing that you feel confident in sourcing. Obviously, I realize this is very tough in COVID right now. I mean, I'm suffering through it too. Like the primary way before COVID that I got information from people was to meet up with them for breakfast or for a drink, right? 
can't do that anymore. And like sensitive sources do not want to have a Zoom with you. So that is extremely challenging and I'm fully cognizant of that. But that being said, there are other types of investigations that are not like that. I mean, an investigation can be just something that takes a very complicated issue and explains it in a simpler, more distilled way for the reader. And for something like that, you know, it, it can start with just reading every single news clip you can find first about that subject, calling every expert, you know, on that area just to make, and the way I know I've called enough people is when I start hearing people repeat the same things over and over and over. And then I know, okay, I've like fully covered my bases. Um, and I think the other important thing is to report against your own biases, right? Sometimes you can hear a tip and it'll like outrage you. But I think a really important thing as journalists is to recognize that we have blind spots. Like we, we come to the job with our own lived experience, our own backgrounds. So for me, I am always trying to poke holes in my own story. I'm trying to anticipate what the reader criticism, what the other side is going to say when it publishes so that I can bulletproof it myself so that when it publishes, it's like the other side can't say anything about it because I've already anticipated all the different ways it's going to get attacked. Um, so yeah, I would say obviously right now, like meeting people in person is very tough, but there are other types of investigations that you can absolutely do even in this environment. Fair enough. Um, I guess one of the most famous investigations you worked on was with the Trump hush money payments um, uh, for the Wall Street Journal. And I was wondering for that, uh, did you get a tip of some sort or uh, was it more product of sort of digging around? Um, so yeah, that, that story kind of had two phases. So the first phase was one of my colleagues got a tip that a lawyer was going around the country paying off women who had slept with Trump. Like that was the tip, that's it, okay? So my colleague at that time, like an incredibly tenacious, persistent reporter, just started calling like every lawyer who's ever worked for Trump, right? And then that kind of led to all the different strands of it. Karen McDougal, Stormy Daniels, and then I got involved when the FBI raided Michael Cohen's home. Uh, that was in like April, 2018. And that was a really big deal at the time because that's when we knew, okay, this is not just some weird payoff now. Like this is a criminal investigation. People could get arrested. So that's where I got involved because I cover law enforcement. You know, I know how to report these kinds of investigations and yeah, a lot of that was like existing sources that I had built up over many years, but it was also new sources that I made, you know, people who felt like they needed to speak out about Michael Cohen and Trump's involvement in this, you know? Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, a mix of both, like kind of depending on my own beat management that I'd had for a few years and also um, convincing new people to talk to me. Okay, fair enough. You mentioned their sort of um, knowing how to report legal cases and so on. And so um, do you think like a formal education in journalism is necessary to be an, an investigative journalist? Absolutely not. And actually, I, I think, I don't want to say it hurts, but like, you know, I think it's actually good for um, reporters to study stuff in college that is not journalism. Because journalism, it's kind of like a trade craft or a skill, right? It's like carpentry, you know? So it's actually very helpful if you come to journalism with like a deep understanding of history, of politics, of economics. Um, like that is really, really important. Like I wish I had paid closer attention to my history classes in college because there's so many things I cover now from, you know, like the George Floyd protests, knowing the history of social justice movements in America is very helpful for something like that. Or like a few years ago, I covered litigation involving Argentina, knowing the kind of very complicated 
like political history of Argentina was crucial for that story. And I had to kind of learn it on the fly. Um, you know, I think the thing about the, the legal beat is that law enforcement can touch so many different things. And especially for me, I'm still like a younger reporter, like knowing and learning that history is a really big part of the job. And I think especially at the New York Times, because there's a big emphasis here to provide context for the reader, you know, to not just be kind of a stenographer of like, X, Y, Z happened today. It's like, we need to tell the reader why this is important. Like, how does this compare to other things that have happened in history? Um, you know, I think especially covering this White House, like a lot of our reporters who cover the White House have covered many, many presidential administrations. So they can situate things in context and really inform the reader in that way. Okay, yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense. Um, and so for you, you mentioned a lot about sort of um, being able to sort of provide context, know the history behind things and so on. Um, I guess sort of the students who are mostly watching this, that's sort of the side we get. So how can we then learn the sort of skills that are specific to journalism? Um, so I think in terms of the basic building block of journalism, for me, reporting is ultimately, you're talking to strangers and trying to get information from them, right? So I think a lot of it is just having conversations with people and practicing that a lot. And like trust and credibility are a huge part of journalism, right? Like I think a lot of people are nervous around reporters because they worry that you know, agreeing to an interview means you're trying to like trap them or do some sort of gotcha thing. But I think it's just practicing like how to have a conversation, how to interview people. And that just comes with time. Like I view journalism almost like a sport. It's just, you have to get the reps in. So I think a college paper is the best opportunity to do that. And I think most importantly, like no story is too small. Any story can be interesting. Like you could be covering the smallest thing, but you can make it interesting by adding the context, adding the history, interviewing a lot of people. And it's just working those muscles. You know, I, like I've been doing this since I was 16, right? I made so many mistakes in like my first 10 years. Like, but it's just, that's why it's important to just write as much as you can. And it's actually better if you start off with really small stories so that if you do make a mistake, the stakes are smaller. Like I wouldn't start your journalism career with like a Me Too investigation of some professor, you know, like work your way up. Like I find that a lot of young reporters I talk to are very impatient. You know, they want to be foreign correspondents. They want to do investigations that take down powerful institutions. But where do those stories come from, right? It comes from like methodical beat reporting that is from the ground up. Like I always say that some of the best investigations really come from kind of small beats. Like if you are covering um, a particular de department at the school or a particular club, you're not gonna be able to do an investigation on it until you're fully like sourced up and you know all the ins and outs of it. And that comes from doing the beat reporting, doing the like 20 small stories that maybe nobody's gonna read but will help you develop the relationships and like learn the tips that you'll need to build up to the bigger investigation. Thank you, that's very useful advice. Um, you mentioned earlier um, kind of switching off your own biases or knowing your own biases and maybe like taking yourself out of the story a little bit. And um, one thing that maybe relates to that a little bit is something that I wondered about um, since you, as, as a legal report as a legal reporter you sit in trials that are probably that, that deal with very heavy topics and um my i imagine um watching the galen maxwell trials is it's quite emotionally taxing um and i was wondering how you whether you take these stories home with you how you deal with that um whether that's something that you've learned to do better over the years yeah yeah i mean it is hard right because as a reporter, you know, you just, you hear from victims like almost every day. And it is very hard because you just can't 
help a lot of them. Like sometimes people will approach me with things that's, it's just not like a story for the New York Times. Like maybe something really, really awful happened to them, but it's just, you know, it's like, it's not a story. And those are really, really difficult conversations to have um, because I think it's like explaining what your role is. Like we are not advocates, right? We, we are truth seekers. That can be very difficult because a lot of these narratives are not a straight line. They're not a clean line. People want you to like report one side of something and ignore all the bad parts. And that's also not our role, right? So it can, it can be very challenging in that sense. I think quite frankly, I mean, some of the hardest stories I had to cover were just at the beginning of the pandemic when we all became healthcare reporters and just having to talk all day long with doctors and nurses. I mean, that was really, really difficult because yeah, you just feel totally helpless. And then at the same time, you're living the story. Like we, we were in New York City hearing about our colleagues getting sick, dying, you know, and then having to cover it. So the whole thing was like horrible and traumatic. But yeah, I mean, it, there's no, and same for, you know, like my black colleagues who have to cover like the George Floyd protests. You're like covering a news event, but it's also can be so personally affecting to you, it is very difficult. And there's no, like, I don't know what the answer is to that. I mean, unfortunately, I bet if you just talk to a lot of veteran reporters, we're kind of just like numb and calloused to it at this point. It's the same I view with like critical reader emails. Like I remember in college when I used to get reader emails that were very personally insulting, like, you know, they, they would bother me so much. And I, I like really affected how I viewed myself. And now it's like, <laughs> I'm like, bring it on. Yeah, you know, it's like, I've gotten that. So it's like, it's just a part of the job that you get used to. It's like kind of messed up, but that is a big part of journalism is like having a steady and even keeled temperament in the face of trauma, in the face of like, horrifically insulting reader emails you know I think our jobs are very public and this is just a side effect of that thank you I guess uh Zon, do you want to ask the next question uh yeah sorry I forgot I was on mute um so also I mean you've mentioned Obviously, your beat is a legal beat, and also you've sort of alluded to your some of your colleagues covering the George Floyd protests over the summer. Uh, and sort of, how did you experience those protests? And I guess what was it like to write about something which sort of so directly affects, uh, you know, friends and colleagues? Yeah, I mean, so the aspect of it that I covered. Um, I wrote about these two lawyers who were arrested at the protest um, and they're now facing like a 45 year mandatory minimum prison sentence for throwing a Molotov cocktail at a police car, right? So I was kind of exploring the complexities of that case. And yeah, I mean, it's just like, it was totally surreal because you are covering again i'm younger right like you're covering something that you've never really witnessed in your lifetime so you know for my colleagues who were like 60 or older they would say like oh this really reminds me of the 70s in new york or like this thing that happened and like i don't have that sort of institutional memory so that made it a little bit more difficult because it just felt like every hour something was happening that I was like, oh my God, this is like utterly shocking and unprecedented, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, unfortunately the reality is you, you just, the work is so all consuming that you, like, at least for me personally, this is probably not the healthiest thing. I just, I don't really take time to kind of like process my feelings about the whole thing. Like the, 
news is so relentless. Like we are all very burnt out <laughs> from the past four years. It's just, yeah, it's like, this is just our job. You know, this is like our role as journalists. We bear witness, we write about what's happening. And yeah, sometimes there's just not time to kind of take a breath and really like process what's going on. You've just um, alluded to the, the past four years as um, <laughs> the the time period that it was. Um, and it, how's your work? How's your work changed through the Trump presidency? Um, what impact has that had? <laughs> I think the biggest impact is that you know he's such a dominant force in the news cycle, right? So it's like every story somehow becomes about Trump, even if it's not really about Trump. Like it's been this very bizarre kind of cloud over every single news event. It's like somehow linked back to Trump. Um, just from like a nitty gritty point of view, obviously after, the, after Trump took office, um, a lot of the cases I ended up covering involved like his associates, people in his administration so that, and you know, I'm based in New York. I cover New York law enforcement. So that was like, a nexus to the White House that I didn't expect um, in terms of my job. Um, but yeah, I think just the biggest impact has been, yeah, Trump is, Trump is the entire news cycle. Like I actually am, like I don't even know what it would be like when he's no longer president because <laughs> it's just, yeah, he's like the air that sucks everything out of the room in a sense. Um, so yeah, like so many investigations are like about Trump, right? And so um, it'll be interesting to see whether it's this year or in four years, just yeah, how the news business kind of adjusts to a president who is not Trump because he has recalibrated so many of our expectations of like what is newsworthy, um, what is worth covering, that sort of thing. and. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see like how much of that will live on even if he is no longer in office. Um, now with less than a week to go um, until the election, I, I, I mean, you're obviously not going to a physical newsroom at the moment, um, I'm guessing, but what is the atmosphere at the New York Times like um, currently? <laughs> um, well, I'm on the Metro desk, so covering New York, so the atmosphere for us is kind of like, okay, like hold your features until after the election because like, why is anyone gonna read that before the election? <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of, I don't know about the newsroom atmosphere because obviously I can't really see anyone. I mean, I think just New York in general, there's this kind of like anxiety in the air. Like I was saying before, I tried to vote um, a few days ago and it was a three hour wait. And there's just this kind of anxiousness with everyone in line. You know, people are like, it's so tense right now. Like it's, everything is insanely polarized and, you know, people are just having fights with their family members. Like it's like a totally crazy environment. So um, in that sense, I'm looking forward to the election being over just because it's like, even when you hang out with friends here, all you talk about is Trump. All you talk about is the election. It's like the number one thing. So yeah, it's, it is this totally all consuming thing. Just, I would say living in New York, it's like everywhere you look, it's like political signs, you know? So um, you really feel like you're in it. And um, I think it's just this sort of nervous anticipation, feeling unsure what's going to happen, like in terms of our coverage plans, you know, are there going to be protests in New York, regardless of the outcome, like knowing how to staff something like that? I mean, it's, you know, I know the police department here is preparing for that, like the Justice Department is preparing for a lot of this. So just like being like bracing for uncertainty, basically. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, courts have already played a huge role um, in this election. I think there's, uh, I read that there's over 350 voting rights related litigations um, in federal and uh, state courts uh, currently. 
um, and they're also likely to play a role in the outcome of the election, um, especially because Trump has used his powers to, to stack the federal courts um, with conservative justices. Um, and now, as you're obviously not a lawyer, um, but uh, what are your thoughts on that as, as someone who spends a lot of time um, dealing with the legal system? No, honestly, I, get, I think all I can say to that is like, we'll wait and see. I mean, I do anticipate there will be a ton of litigation after the election, no matter the outcome. And, you know, we're prepared to cover that, but it's just so hard to predict. I mean, if there's one thing I've learned from the past four years, it's like, everyone's predictions about everything were wrong. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I think, like I said earlier, in terms of covering it or like, um, yeah, it's just reporters have to be very nimble now because, you know, every day is kind of this like fire hydrant of news and unexpected events. And you have to just go with the flow and like be ready to cover something that is totally unexpected. But yeah, I mean, I do anticipate there will be litigation across the country and um, we'll cover it when that happens. Um, uh, I'd say the pandemic has in many ways sort of uh, proven how important uh, journalism is for delivering reliable information, uh, communicating policies, and also um, holding authorities to account. Uh, also, we've seen a big surge in conspiracy theories and, as you say, increasing polarization. And uh, so what I think I think there's a general sentiment that the media, much of the media has uh, lost a lot of public trust. And so what do you think uh, the media can or should do to regain that trust? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, so for me personally, I mean, I think trust and credibility are the most important things in our business. So yes, it's very distressing to me to see how much that has been fractured over the past, not just four years, but like decade probably. Um, it's very, I mean, a lot of things have contributed to it. I do think reporters should spend less time on Twitter because the average reader, when they see your tweet, they think you're speaking for the voice of your institution. I think that's a hugely, like damaging thing for credibility. If you tweet something that's wrong or that's a partisan opinion, I feel very strongly about that. And I also think that's something that young reporters, a lot of them, when I talk to them, they talk about their personal brand, right? And I think it can be very like sexy to be like, oh, I'm just gonna try and get like a lot of Twitter followers and that's the way to get a career in journalism. That is not true. And if somebody is hiring you for that, you shouldn't work there, you know, like Twitter, just because you're good at getting Twitter followers does not mean you are a good reporter. Um, that's number one. I think number two is just correcting things when you are wrong. That is so, so, so important, right? Um, I think just when you mess up, you need to own up to it and attach a correction to the story. And I think that's something that should start at like the journal student journalism level. Like if something is wrong online, don't just tweak it and then don't say anything, right? I think that's the worst you can do because readers will notice that and then they'll be like, why didn't you acknowledge that you were wrong? I think the third thing is, and um, you know, I'm lucky that like the Journal and the Times both have very strong journalism ethics. So I have had good training in this, but you know, in terms of writing tough stories about the Trump administration or whoever, any institution, they should not be surprised when they read it in the paper because you should be giving them a heads up ahead of time about the allegations that will be in the article and give them ample time to respond. I feel very strongly about that. And I, I think there should never be a situation where like some prominent person reads their name in the paper in a negative way. And it's like, I never got a phone call about this, right? Like, I think, like, we cannot take shortcuts on that. Like, you have to give heads up to people. And that is something that can be hugely damaging to credibility. If someone says, oh, they didn't reach out to me. If they had, I would have said, 
X, Y, Z, right? They ignored that, you know, and this is the same thing about going against your biases, right? I mean, at the Wall Street Journal, it was, it went so far as to like, I had to seek comment from like Hezbollah, right? Like I had to seek comment from like the Chinese government about whether they were hacking America, okay? You just, you always have to seek comment because you never know if they're going to respond. And that is so important for fairness and accuracy too. Um, so yeah, I mean, for me personally, you know, I can't control sort of the loss and trust and the loss and credibility. I can only control how people feel about me. And, you know, my personal philosophy is like, I'm never going to sacrifice my own ethics, my own standards, you know, for clicks or for Twitter follows or, you know, to win an award. Like none of that is worth it if it means you will lose credibility with your readers. You know, for me, I always felt like the best compliments I get on a story are when I write a story criticizing somebody and they tell me after like, you know, I thought you treated it very fairly. To me, that is the highest compliment you can get because it means that you presented the truth in a way that was accurate. That's a very good lead into the next question. I mean, they sort of, you talk a lot about sort of uh, fairness um, and sort of a big debate, I think, on both sides of the Atlantic has been about the idea of sort of objectivity in media and what does that look like in an age of disinformation where you know the Trump administration is operating with alternative facts um, but then also uh, sort of questions a lot of questions like how do you provide balance on issues like systemic racism um, and uh, you know or um, sexism, climate change, those sorts of issues. Uh, what are your opinions on that? Yeah, I mean, those are, that's a very tough question and it kind of varies by institution, right? And, you know, having worked at the Journal and the Times, like it certainly does vary depending on the workplace. Um, you know, it's, it's like, for me, it's a story by story basis, literally. Um, it, you can't, I think as a newsroom, you can't kind of set blanket policies about stuff like that. I think there's some things that are obvious, right? Like if you're covering the Charlottesville rally, the top quote should not be a white supremacist. You know, there's like certain kind of standards that are obvious. Um, but yeah, I mean, it can get super messy. And, you know, you can say like as a newsroom, you know, we, we always oppose racism. We always support free speech, right? But in practice for each story and each paragraph of a story, those it's just, it really comes down to kind of the vetting of a story and just making, for me, it's like kind of what I said before, when I'm writing about sensitive topics like that and things that are very hot rod issues, I, will literally go through each sentence and say to myself, like, can I justify why I put this sentence in here? And then I will kind of step back and look at the whole thing and say, did I present the truth of what happened, right? And that doesn't mean getting both sides equal weight. It's, did I present the truth of what actually happened at this thing, you know? Like, for example, if you're covering, um, a child sex trafficking case, you're not going to quote somebody saying child sex trafficking is good. You know, there are like obvious things that, and, and quite frankly, a lot of that comes with time and it comes with having good editors who are experienced. There's no formula to it. And I, I it can be very tricky. I understand for a student journalist, um, but sometimes you just have to trust your gut and trust your instinct. And if that's un still unclear, calling experts, right? For me, whenever I'm unsure about stuff, I just call more people. Like most things can be fixed just with more reporting, right? If you call like a hundred people who are experts on extremism, they will tell you, you know, which of these ideas are not even worth you publishing because you would be giving a platform to a fringe group, right? So I think if you don't have experienced editors that you can turn to, it's just 
calling experts like you know for stuff with like covid for example um calling as many doctors epidemiologists health experts as you can like in my book it's like you can never call enough people because you know you want i and sometimes i'll call an expert and i'll say this is how i'm characterizing this movement or this group do you think that's accurate like is this how you would characterize it you know i'm always kind of bouncing things off experts so that you know i'm giving them an opportunity to weigh in on like whether i have act accurately reported something thank you i think uh Shannon is now going to get the q a started yes um i'm not sure if shannon can if her audio is working at the moment um so I'll just take over there quickly. Um, for, yeah, thank you, Nicole, for um, all of that, especially the answer to that last question, I think, um, gave me a lot of uh, things to, to keep in mind for um, student journalism. Um, I think we had a question from um, Daria that fit very well into this. Um, Daria, would you like to turn on your camera and ask your question? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Hello. Um, probably in the interest of time, I cut my question short. So, um, Nicole, in terms of like when you first joined um, the journalism team as an as a journalist, sort of, how would you say the type of skills that you needed to have changed compared to like what the journalists of today are required to have? Mm, yeah. Um, I think social media is a big part of it. Um, like when I started, Twitter was barely a thing, right? And now editors are reading Twitter all day long. And sometimes they will ask you to check things out that they read on Twitter. And that can be very frustrating. <laughs> I think, um, obviously the Trump administration has changed a lot about journalism, just in the sense that yeah, I mean, I think the Trump White House has really tried to make the press like a partisan player in politics, like an active participant, right? And I really think it's important for us to kind of resist getting pulled into that because it just goes to the kind of trust and credibility issue. Like we are not the resistance. We are not the opposition party. We are just reporting the facts. And yes, maybe people see that and they think that that's what the resistance is, but it's not, that's not our mandate. That's not, um, that's not our mission. I think that's really important. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I understand now there's so many more platforms to think about. That's been a huge shift. Like, like you know, now people should, like, we have to think about how things look on mobile, how like a video might look in an Instagram story, maybe, you know, there's so many formats for our stories now. Like if you have a big visual story, we have to talk to graphics very early on in the process to get that going. That was not really a thing when I started like eight years ago, even like nobody thought about SEO or visuals. And now it's, you know, the photos, the videos, everything that go into a story are part of the journalism itself that you're doing a disservice to the reader if the story has a bad headline or it has no photos, right? Like I used to write all these stories with no photos at all. And now that's like not even allowed. Like you cannot publish a story at the New York Times without a photo. So it is, it's like adapting to the way readers consume news. I think obviously mobile, that's been a huge shift and like some newsrooms have been better than others about adapting. I think the New York Times has been like a leader in kind of digital presentation and innovation on that front. So I'm really grateful for that because they're always pushing us to think like, how can we get a new audience? How can we get a younger audience, a bigger audience, you know, an overseas audience? Like we're translating, you know, more stories than we ever have into foreign languages, which I think is a huge service. So, so yeah, I think, you know, when I started in journalism, it was, there were like built in assumptions about who reads newspapers. And now 
we are finally adapting to the idea that it's important to get a big diverse online audience and there are different ways to do that. Um, I think uh, Neve had a question if you'd like to unmute and ask it. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I was just wondering, um, in the beginning, when you're just starting out your journalism career, how do you build up a network um, when you have like no contacts? How do you build up off that base? Great question. Um, so usually when you're starting on a journalism, you'll have a beat. Um, my first beat was covering the currency market which was super boring, but what I did, and it was by the way, in subject area that I had zero background or expertise or interest in. Like I basically got this job because I needed employment and I needed health insurance because in America, we do not have <laughs> universal health insurance. So um, yeah, I started on this beat. I didn't know anything. And basically what I did was I searched old, like news articles that had been written about my beat. And I just started with the people who had been quoted in those articles, because first of all, you know that they're already willing to talk to journalists because they've been quoted, right? So I kind of start there. And this is like pre-COVID advice, but I would get coffee with them. I would introduce myself and say, hi. And yeah, I think like lean into your newness and your youngness. Like I think there's an instinct when you're a young reporter to pretend like you know more than you do. And that's actually where a lot of people mess up but like lean into the fact that you don't know anything because in the process of people over explaining things to you, you can get some very good tips and stories, right? Like if you went up to someone and you said like, can you explain like how the tax system works for rich people in America? That's actually a very illuminating conversation, right? Instead of pretending like, you know, the ins and outs of tax policy. So I would start with these initial meetings and then I always asked who else should I talk to? Like, who, who do you see as an expert in this industry? Who do you think is doing like really interesting stuff right now? Who do you want to read a profile about? Like, is there somebody in your circle that you've always been intrigued by them? Like, I would ask also, is somebody doing, you know, do you, is there anybody where you're like, how did they get there? Like, how come no one's taken them down yet? Right? Like, that is how somebody like a Harvey Weinstein can get exposed because he's, everyone in Hollywood knew it all, but it's like, were people asking the right questions, you know? So I think you can just start with like a handful of people who have already been quoted. So, you know, they're comfortable with the press and just build your network out. Every single person you meet, ask who else should I call and then call all those people and then just keep going that way. I also think now with LinkedIn, it makes everything so much easier because you can, if you're covering, you know, it's not like a company or whatever, you can just search on LinkedIn and find all of their employees and message them that way. Yeah, so I think we have a question from Claire about diversity in journalism. Claire, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, yeah, so I just, I just, this is just something I'm asking out of curiosity, but I'm just wondering what you think are the main challenges um, of working in an industry that's like kind of notorious for having a real lack of diversity in terms of like, whether it's gender identity, like um, socioeconomic background or like um, race, ethnicity, like how, how do you, like, what do you think are the main struggles or like obstacles to overcome and like, do you have any particular like anecdotes, that sort of thing? Oh God, I could talk about this for an hour. Um, <laughs> so yes, there are many challenges. Um, I think being a woman is like a whole thing. Um, I think especially in legacy media, um, you'll, and especially on investigative reporting teams, it's very rare to find a woman of color. So like I was often the only person in the room who looked like me and I just became accustomed to that, right? Um, 
I think it can come up with pay equity issues. I mean, this is like a whole thing. If you guys have followed the Bon Appetit drama over the summer, that is American media right there in a nutshell, you know? Um, I think, yeah, it's, it, I think in terms of diversity, like where it's really, really necessary is shaping coverage. So for way too long, I think news organizations basically kind of wrote for their audience, which were upper middle class to wealthy white people and often men as well. Um, so when you think about audience in that way, that's going to affect the kinds of stories you choose, right? That might make you more willing to do a story where the victim is white versus the story where the victim is black. That might make you more willing to do a story that involves a bunch of people who went to Ivy League schools than a bunch of people who went to community college, right? Like maybe there's a high bar, higher bar for that. I think there might be a reluctance to focus on like a smaller community, like doing a story just on, you know, Japanese Americans for something. Like that might be a harder sell than doing a story about, it, you know, white people who went to Harvard and were on the sailing team. You know, like there's, it comes into coverage in so many ways and it's, it's difficult because it is true that sometimes um, when you're writing about more marginalized communities, yeah, those are not gonna get that as many clicks because you know, you write for people who can afford to pay for subscriptions, right? So that is a very difficult tension. And I think it's about figuring out how to do both, right? Like it, it's not either or, like you can do all of it. Um, and, but yeah, those can be very kind of tricky news judgment type things. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, look, I look very young and that just in terms of being a female reporter, like the meeting dynamic is like a lifelong thing of sitting in a meeting with all men, trying to talk, not getting interrupted, not having them take credit for your ideas not having them like discredit you, right? <laughs> um, I was actually quite lucky because like I had a recent meeting where one of my older white male colleagues actually, he like stopped the meeting and was like, okay, guys, can we let Nicole talk now? And I was like, thank you. <laughs> um, and it's, it's especially hard now on Zoom because you have to like shout to interrupt and I think it, the other way where it comes into play is there are stereotypes and biases about what an aggressive reporter looks like, right? People imagine like a schlubby white male reporter with like ill-fitted clothes, you know, being very persistent on the phone and like barging through the door. That is what people picture when they see investigative reporter, right? So if you come in as like a polite Asian American woman, that is not what people picture as aggressive, right? And also my personality is not aggressive in that sense. Like I don't scream at people, you know, I don't yell at customer service. That's just not my personality. But what I've learned from doing this for a while is like that is totally okay because there are different ways to get information from people. And that kind of blunt hammer approach of some male reporters doesn't work if you're talking to victims. It doesn't work if you're talking to other, you know, groups of people. I think for a very long time, it was kind of like male reporters reporting on powerful men, right? So they kind of spoke the same language. They're like golfing, they're smoking cigars, like drinking whiskey together. But now it's like, there is a new paradigm and there's different ways to be a good reporter. So I think if you're starting out, like don't get discouraged by that. Like that will very much be a dynamic, but just remember that like they are not better than you like you, you just you're getting to the same place but in a different way and aggression looks different in everybody and it's not always that kind of like 
violent male thing. Like you can be very persistent without doing that. And that was something that took me a while to learn because when I started out in journalism, I was kind of like, oh my God, like all these men are yelling. They're like, fuck you to their source. Like that's not my personality. But then I was like, oh, I'm getting scoops too, but I'm just like asking nicely, right? Like <laughs> if you, you don't, there's different ways to like get people to open up. So yeah, I would just say, don't get discouraged. Like don't give up. It will be difficult in the beginning for sure. Um, and like, please reach out to me if you decide to go into journalism and you have those moments because, you know, I talk about this stuff with my women friends all the time. Like it is a daily thing, but you just, you learn to overcome it. And quite frankly, you can use it to your advantage because sometimes when sources or people in the newsroom underestimate you, you really can use that to your advantage. So I think I spent a long time early in my career kind of sulking about this, you know, being like, oh, this would be so much easier if I was like X, Y, Z. But then I was like, no, this is actually my strength. Like, because I'm different. You know, there are ways I can use this to my advantage. Like for example, sources tend to remember who I am because when I go to a legal conference, I'm always the only person who like looks like me. So they remember me, right? I stand out in that sense. Um, and, you know, also because I look so young, people think that they always have to like over explain things to me. And I, I seem less threatening that way, right? So they might say yes to an interview from me versus like the scary white dude reporter who has a Pulitzer, you know, cause I'm like very disarming and I look totally harmless, you know? So you can, these, these things are your strength and just don't get too down on yourself about things that you can't control. And yeah, just try to turn all these things into things that can work for you. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I can only um, follow up on that. Thank you for, for that, um, especially that last answer um, was, was super, super helpful. And there's so many things from this uh, discussion today that I'm gonna have to keep thinking about, um, I think. Um, we've now, overrun a little bit and uh, we're going to let you get back to your um, very busy day. Um, but thank you so much for joining us today um, and for, yeah, for taking the time um, and being so open um, to all of these questions. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, if anyone wants to reach out to me by email, you know, my email is on my Twitter account. Like, please do reach out anytime. Thank you. Yeah, I also wanted to thank Nicole for all of the brilliant things that she said. Um, she's definitely given me a lot to think about and so many gems have been shared in the past hour. Um, and for any of our audience, um, if you want to stay tuned for our future events to learn more and be inspired, um, we'll be publicizing those on our Facebook, The Oxford Blue, and on our Instagram at The Oxford Blue. So thank you so, so much for coming and for engaging with this discussion with Nicole. And I hope that you've learned so much from this discussion as much as I have. All right, bye. Thank you so much. Bye, bye everyone.